As most of you know, we in a brand new sermon series entitled The Tender Commandments, looking at the Ten Commandments, I want to do a few words of review regarding uh, the commandments of God. For many people, they have a false notion about the Ten Commandments. They kind of look at them as dictatorial fiats from a capricious God who is trying to go and show us how bossy and uh, strong he is, when in reality what I want us to understand uh, that that is an entirely false picture of God giving us these tender commandments. Instead, what I want you to do is consider that these are words from a loving, gracious, heavenly Father that has a plan and a purpose for us. He cares for us, he provides for us, and he wants to extend the very best in our lives. I want you to envision kind of being a parent or working with a child, and you give that child some very clear-cut rules. These are rules with a reason. You just don't give them for no reason. They are to be life-giving and life-protecting. And when a child, especially when they get older, uh, become a teenager, a young adult, and you have some pretty significant rules, but they choose not to listen to those rules, it's hard because you see the child suffer, You see other people suffer, and you as a parent suffer as well. I want you to consider that when we break these rules, it actually breaks God's heart. He is saddened that we are suffering needlessly when he wants to bless us tremendously. And what I want to do today is begin to understand that the laws of God are good. God has given those for a reason in our lives. Uh, The law of God has uh, three uh, purposes. Let's talk about that for just a moment or two. Uh, So first, it's uh, like a curb. It protects us and it protects others. Uh, Second, the law of God is like a ruler. It uh, guides us. It allows us to know what's right and what's wrong. And then a third, uh, the laws of God are like a mirror. It shows us the reflection of who we are. Uh, We see our sinful condition uh, regarding our actions. We also need to know that the tender commandments are really broken up into two tables. Let's talk about the two tables for just a moment. The first table of the law is the first three commandments, commandments one through three, and it centers on our vertical relationship. In other words, it's talking about our relationship with God. Uh, The second table of the law centers on commandments 4 through 10, and it looks at our horizontal relationship or our relationships with other people. And it's important for us to understand that in the Old Testament, there were 613 laws, and then there came these 10 commandments, but then Jesus himself summarizes these 10 commandments. In Matthew chapter 22, verses 37 and following, it says it this way. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and strength. And second, love your neighbor as yourself. Those Ten Commandments are broken down into two big ideas. What are these two big ideas? Simply put, the two big ideas are love God and love other people. Now... When we think about the Ten Commandments, we immediately think about that word, Ten Commandments, but that's not really an appropriate word for them. They're called the Deca Log. Deca, Ten, Log, or Logoi comes from the word. So it's really the Ten Words that comes from God to us. Most of the commandments that are given to us are straightforward, punchy, and to the point. There's not a lot of mincing of words when we look at these commandments. And finally, I really want you to understand that this comes from a heart of a gracious, caring, and loving God who wants to provide, protect, and bless you and me. So, with that said, I want us to look at our morning's message entitled, The One and Only. And we're going to begin uh, by turning to Exodus chapter 20, verses 3 through 5. If you haven't already done so, please uh, take out your notes so you can follow along with our morning's message. And we're going to be unpacking uh, this uh, first commandment today, starting at verse 3. 
you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. Verse 5, you shall not bow down to them or worship them. In another translation that we looked at earlier, it said that, that God is a jealous God. When we talk about uh, jealous people, we kind of have a negative connotation, don't we? Uh, we think of the jealous boyfriend or girlfriend, or we think about the jealous husband or wife, and we think that they're unreasonable and uh, they're not thinking clearly, uh, but that isn't the image of God. Instead, what I want you to consider is think about this as an illustration. For those of you who've been married, Let's say you're even happily married, and uh, your spouse turns to you, uh, maybe on an anniversary or some special occasion, a birthday, Valentine's Day, and they come to you and say, you have been such a blessing. Boy, I am so happy that I'm married to you, but I wanted to let you know I'd like to see other people. But it's nothing against you. I just want others in my life. I hope you won't be offended. And that would irk me if that was my circumstance. And I suspect it would irk some of you. But you know, there are a lot of things that irk us, don't us? For example, when I'm on my lunch break down at Vaughn's trying to grab some food, I'm irked when the person directly in front of me wants to pull out a stack of coupons this high, <laughs> or they want to get a money order, or they want to sell, send a telegram via Pony Express, and it just drives me crazy. Another thing that really irks me is when you're on the highway, let's say you're on the 91, and somebody has to cut you off, right? Because they've got to get to wherever they're going, and all of a sudden, they slow down in front of you 10, 15, or 20 miles, and you think, well, why'd you cut me off in the first place? But the thing that probably irks me more than anything, it just chaps my proverbial hide, is when I am standing in line, and I've been there for a long time. And somebody does one of two things. One, they pretend they just have a short question. And they don't really need to wait in that huge line that everybody else is, and they go around me. Or the second thing that even irks me even more is when they pretend that I and 40 of my closest friends who've been waiting forever are not even there. When somebody cuts in front of me, it just makes me mad. It's not right. It's wrong. There should be some sort of law against it. Have you ever thought about that's what idolatry is? When other things or people cut in front of God, he was there first before the line ever existed. And I think that's what happened. So let's take a look at what God's Word has to say regarding idolatry, regarding idolatry. Usually when we think of idolatry, we might think of a quote-unquote image of the book of Exodus and the people have a, a pagan golden calf. Indeed, uh, the word idolatry refers uh, to image worship. This is something we call coarse idolatry. In Moses' day, they had all kinds of gods, uh, Ashtoreth, Baal, Molech. Uh, they also had gods uh, for fertility, uh, gods for the harvest, gods for the sun, and gods for the moon. There were all kinds of small g gods that people had, uh, but idolatry has a far more subtle form. It doesn't have to have a, a statue. It's called refined idolatry. And it's whenever anything or anyone takes the place that's rightfully God's. In the scriptures, let me share with you a couple examples. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says this, you cannot serve both God and mammon or money. You really need to let that sink in, that money and the pursuit of mullah over the pursuit of the Messiah can easily happen in people's lives. Uh, writing to his young protege, Timothy, Paul, the sage apostle, writes these words recorded in 2 Timothy 3, 4. They are lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. People can uh, pursue uncontrollably uh, different kinds of pleasures in their lives. Here's a, a third and final one found in Philippians chapter 3, verse 19. Paul says, their God is their stomach. 
in context, he's talking about a group of people in Rome called the Epicureans that were pursuing uh, their personal pleasures, but we also know many people who are driven by their appetites. And that's precisely what the prophet Isaiah is discussing, and he's giving a powerful illustration in the scriptures. In Isaiah chapter 44, verse 9, verse 13, and then finally verses 16 and 17, we read these words, all who make idols are nothing. Uh, that word there for nothing is the Hebrew word tohu, and it's one of the more commonly used words in uh, the writings of Isaiah. And the things they treasure are worthless. Uh, those who would speak up for them are blind. They are ignorant for their own shame. Physical things can become idols if we act in idolatrous ways with our hearts. Let's take a look at some things that are actually good that can become idols. First, greed makes money an idol. We know uh, that the Bible says that the love of money is the cause of all kinds of evil. It's not money. There's nothing inherently wrong with money. It's neither good nor bad. Uh, but what we do with that money, and if money has our heart, then it can easily become an idol. Second, Lust can make sex an idol. Sex is God's idea. It's good within the right confines and context. But what can happen is this gift can be abused, misused, and used in wrong ways and become an idol. Third, we see that vanity can make our bodies idols. The Apostle Paul tells us very clearly uh, that our bodies are a temple of the Holy Spirit. Paul added these words uh, that physical exercise profited some. So what happens is when people's obsession with diet, working out, and surgical procedures takes precedence over God, when they live a selfie existence, uh, then this becomes a God. And what I want you to understand, anything that cuts in front of God is really nothing. In context, uh, we see this word, tohu, nothing. And it's used in a variety of different places in the Bible. For instance, in Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, Moses writes, Now the earth was formless, that's the word nothing, and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And what happens is the prophet Isaiah then talks about specifically what happens when we go and have an idol that we create. Starting at verse 13 in Isaiah chapter 44, uh, the prophet Isaiah shares these words. The carpenter measures with a line and makes an outline with the marker. He roughs it out with chisels and marks it with compasses. He shapes it in the form of man, of man in all his glory, that it may dwell in a shrine. Listen carefully to verses 16 and 17. Half of the wood he burns in the fire. Over it he prepares his meal, he roasts his meat and eats his fill. He also warms himself and says, Ah, I am warm, I see the fire. From the rest he makes a god, his idol. He bows down to it and worships. He prays to it and says, Save me, you are my god. Think about what the prophet is saying here. Uh, he's making a profound statement. He's saying that people are taking this big piece of wood, they're cutting the wood in half, uh, the first half is used to warm themselves and to cook some food, but the second half is made for an idol, and they worship this piece of wood, and then they pray to this piece of wood and cry out, you are my God. But what I want you to understand is these kind of gods will always leave us empty. I want to talk about the danger of idolatry in our day and age. Here are two ideas that I want you to consider. The first idea is that idolatry is cunning. This is when a good thing becomes a God thing, and that is a very bad thing. It can sneak upon us. It can capture our hearts. And before we know it, uh, these things uh, have us and our affections of our hearts, minds, and lives. We don't always use the word idolatry, do we? Instead, I want to use perhaps a more modern a psychological term, addiction. 
When you consider an addiction, that is an idolatrous relationship. This addiction, whether it's drugs, it guides and directs a person's life. It consumes them. Gambling, alcohol, a varying sex addictions, they all are people's gods. Let's uh, consider the second reality, and that is that idolatry is disappointing. Idolatry always overpromises and underdelivers. Success promises satisfaction but leaves you empty. Money promises security, but tragedy can still strike. And sex promises thrills, but leaves you all alone. Physical things, the things we see, taste, and touch and experience can become idolatrous. Idolatry at its core is this false image worship. Writing to the church in Colossae, the Apostle Paul writes these words regarding another image. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 15, the Apostle Paul writes, Christ, or Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. If we want to know what God is like, we look to Jesus. That's the only image we are to pursue. So, to summarize what we've shared, number one, idolatry is cunning. It takes good things and makes them into God things, and that's a bad thing. And two, idolatry is disappointing. It always overpromises and underdelivers. But there's good news that there is one who makes a promise and he delivers on his promise. In the book of Ephesians, we read these words penned by the Apostle Paul. Now to him, God, who is able to do immeasurably more than we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Jesus never leaves us wanting for more. When I was 17 years old, my youth pastor, Derek Lauer, was a wonderful communicator of God's Word, and he later planted many churches and led many congregations over the years. And I still remember a sermon he gave. It was part of a sermon series on the Ten Commandments called God's Top Ten. It was more than 30 years ago. And I want to share with you part of his outline. And his outline was, how do you keep God your one and only? These are practical steps by God's grace and the Spirit's empowerment that enables us to keep God at the forefront of our minds and our hearts. So, let me share them with you. First, give Him first priority in every decision. Give him first priority in every decision. Sometimes, if I'm going to be honest, I make choices, and I never ask God for his opinion. I make the choice myself, and then what I want is God to go and give me his stamp of approval. In other words, I want God to bless the decision that I've already made in my own heart. And this is what I've discovered, and maybe some of you have had this experience. When you've decided to do something, you haven't conferred with God, you know that it's, I guess, a good idea, but it's certainly not God's idea, and you go and make that decision. It doesn't work out real well. And then, if you've ever done this, you get at, mad at God for allowing you to make that choice. <laughs> and I think that's something that happens with us. Listen to these profound words of wisdom recorded here in Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, starting at verse 5. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to Him, and He, God, will make your paths straight. Are we trusting, are we leaning, and are we submitting to Him? The second way that I think was so helpful that my youth pastor shared with me is this. Give God first place in every relationship. Give God first place in every relationship. Truthfully, there are going to be relationships in your life that some of them will bring you closer to God, but others will bring you further from God. Some of them will encourage your faith and others will discourage your faith. There are going to be relationships in your life that you need to end. In other words, you need to stop being around these people. And then there are relationships that you have to reconnect. I was so blessed in my own life. I had mentors and people that keep me accountable and speak into my life. Do you have people that speak into your life God's truth? Speaking of God's truth, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 57 and following, it says this, that bad company corrupts good morals. 
The third uh, practical aspect to keeping God our one and only is give God the first dime on every dollar. Give God the first dime on every dollar. Of course, I'm talking about first fruits giving. This is that biblical notion of tithing. Uh, the idea is this, that you go and give 10%, you save 10%, and you live on 80%. I have a wonderful fellow pastor in this circuit. And this is what he told me. I want to share this with you. It's so wise. He says, I'd rather live on 80% with God than 100% or without God. Isn't that profound? Look at uh, the fourth way we can put God. Number one is give God the first minutes of every day. Give God the first minutes of every day. Mark chapter 1 verse 35 says, very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he had prayed. Jesus left in the morning hours. But here's what I need you to understand. This is not a, a law. Uh, this is grace-oriented. So uh, let's say you're not a morning person. Maybe you have a long commute down to work or back from work. You can spend time with God there. Maybe you're one of those night owls. I know that a couple people I work with here, they are total night owls. So I said, that's probably a better time. For me, sometimes the time is during my lunch hour that I will go and try to get away from all the busyness of time in my life. Do we give God the best part of our day, the worst part of our day, or any part of the day? I understand that there are pressures, but there's also priorities. What are your priorities? And then lastly, he wrote, give God the first call in times of trouble. Give God the first call in times of trouble. The words of the psalmist echo in my mind, call on me in the day of trouble, and I will deliver you, and you will honor me. The Lord should be our first line of defense, not our last-ditch effort. I don't want to point anyone out, but this has happened to me on more than one occasion. People will come up and say this, well, pastor, I have tried absolutely everything. I might as well pray. My suggestion is start with prayer and continue to trust him. I want to close with a few thoughts. St. Augustine, an early church father, said it so poignantly. He said, Lord, you have made us for yourselves, and our hearts are restless until they find rest in thee, O God. God is the one we find true rest in. I'm a huge uh, Elvis Presley fan. I think it came from my mom. Uh, she loved the king of rock and roll. And I remember as a little kid, I was literally watching uh, as a little boy his final interview, his last interview, about six months in 1977 before he passed away. And the interviewer turned to him and he said these words, uh, Mr. Presley, when you were young, you said you wanted to be uh, rich, famous, and happy. Uh, Elvis then uh, heard these words from the interviewer, are you happy? Elvis said, I'm terribly lonely. Thank you very much. No, he didn't say that last part. No, it was, it, it, I just thought it was funny. Um, God only satisfies if you are living your life in such a way where you are the center of your own universe, you are not God. That is always going to leave you unsatisfied. There is only one who is worthy of worship. There is only one who made you and redeemed you at the cross. There is only one who is with you every single day of your life in the good times and the bad times. There is only one who always delivers on his promises, and that is God. God who is the true God, the living God, who made you and redeemed you through Jesus the Christ. No other gods will satisfy. No other God is the true God, only the God of the Bible. Don't allow other false little G gods to get in the way of the true God. Jesus is that God who redeemed you, who forgave you. After the cross, Jesus proved he could be trusted. You can trust him with your life. Amen? Let's link our hearts together in a word of